Good evening. It is great to see all of you here tonight. Thankful for the presence of everybody who's come to be a part of this midweek assembly, and we're especially glad that we've got a number of visitors with us here tonight. We always begin with the devotional here in the auditorium, and uh, then we'll head off to some uh, Bible classes. Tonight is the last night for the uh, various studies that uh, we've been involved in, uh, so we'll look forward to those classes. Uh, Bobo is going to be leading us in our songs tonight. Josh is going to be extending the invitation, and then Ivan will be uh, leading us in our family prayer tonight. So let's... Uh, Let's join in together and sing as Bible comes to lead us. I will enter. If you've ever been in a situation where you're trying to just press through something, just press through, just keep going, head down and just keep going. Uh, it may have been a physical obstacle. Uh, you may have played sports. Any of you have played football. There were times when you just had to press forward, press on. Uh, and there's things we do that in our lives. There's things we have to press forward, press through. Uh, school, you guys that are finishing up, you just this is the last little around the bend, 100 yard uh, dash to the end. Uh, you're just pressing through. There may be things in life that they're, they're struggling with right now, and you just need to press through, press on. Uh, and as we look at uh, Philippians chapter 3, Paul gives us a word of encouragement about that. Uh, beginning of verse 10, he said, That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death. And I read about that, what that is like uh, in uh, Romans chapter 6, when he talks about the likeness of, of baptism being that, being conformed to the death. Uh, in that way as well. Um, but he says, The fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain the to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained it, or have already per uh, become perfect, perfect, but I press on, so that I may lay hold for that which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There may be things that you need to just forget about and that you have baggage in your life. I think of all people, Saul of Tarsus might have had reason to have baggage in his life. You think about the things that he did as Saul and the things that he did to the church, the body of Christ as Saul. He could have had some baggage. He could have had some emotional baggage in connection with his past. But he had to forget those things, know that he was forgiven for those things. And there may be things that you need to let go of that aren't yours anymore. You've given it to God. I've been forgiven of my sins. Keep, quit holding on to that that would weigh you down and press forward. Maybe there are things that uh, aren't yours. Well, sometimes we're good at borrowing trouble, right? And we, uh, we begin to get involved in other people's lives and other people's things. And it is good to help. It is good to lend a, a helping a, a shoulder to cry on. But sometimes we borrow trouble that's not ours. Let it go. Let that go. Paul says, I'm reaching forward to the goal. Do you have a goal marked out in your mind? Do you have that prize in your mind ahead of you? Have you ever done anything where you've tried to, to hit the mark, uh, but you aim at the smallest part of that mark, right? When you're aiming for something to aim true, Picture that mark in your mind. Where am I going? I'm going to the gates of heaven. I'm going to sit by the throne of my Lord, and I'm going there. Is that in your mind? Is that goal there? So you may be pressing through a week. You may be pressing through some difficult times. You may be finishing up school, wondering, when will this end? Counting down the days. But in all these things, press forward for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The prize that is there. We are called by the gospel of Christ as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. We are called by the gospel. 
Paul was in a unique situation where he could say, and the apostles were in a unique situation where they could say they were called physically by Jesus. Uh, but we were called by the gospel that those preached, they preached and continues to be preached today. That gospel message is that Christ Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, and that being the Son of God, we must believe in him, believe that he uh, is the Son of God. Having faith in him, repenting of our sins, uh, being immersed, confessing him before men, being immersed in baptism and walking in newness of life. If you want to make that change today so that you can press forward to that goal, please come now as we stand and as we sing. Here's my It is now time for us to have that family prayer, and if you filled out one of these blue prayer request cards, if you'll just hold it up, the ushers will be uh, collecting them and bringing them to me. Uh, uh, visitors, this church believes in prayer. I say that every week. I say it because I want our visitors to know we're not just doing something. We're changing what's happening on this earth, and you, we need to believe that. That's believing in prayers, and so these things that are included in this prayer are things that uh, are really, really important to us, and so we need to be uh, aware of it and do all that we can in, to pray, uh, pray for it. Um, I, I, I do not have any updates on two of our members. Does anybody know if Amy is home yet or not? She was due, hopefully, to go home in a couple of days the last time I talked to her, and I just do not know. And then uh, uh, also, uh, let's see, the other name is Kay Richardson. Kay, Kay Richardson was hoping to also to go home this week. And I, I've not had any update at all on those two. But we need to remember, continue to remember uh, uh, them in our prayers uh, and uh, do all that we can to, to uh, be a part of their lives and everything. Uh, Robert uh, Mar uh, Mariano says, uh, I have... Uh, some kind of cell carcinoma removal procedures on the 20th. And so we need to remember that. And if I say squashmos, I'm not sure that, I'm sure that's not what the, the way you pronounce that, but uh, uh, a lot of things I don't know about cancer, but Robert, you will be in our prayers. We need to be aware also that Zula Garrett, that's uh, Sky uh, Brown and Dan McLeod's mom has been moved to Gardens Court and we need to uh, remember uh, them in our prayers. We also need to, to remember in our prayers our shut-ins. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how many people are on that shut-in list, and there are some that, are, that uh, may not be on that list, but they're, 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 they're very, very sick. And uh, just give you an update on Silas. Silas has that port that they use for dialysis. They put a, he had trouble with it. They put in a new port, and it started bleeding, so they... Took him to the hospital, he was in the VA hospital, but he's now back at rehab, and so uh, 
We just need to remember, uh, remember all of our shut-ins. Uh, Johnny Green says, would you remember my sister-in-law, Mary Jackson? She's been diagnosed with having gout, painful to walk. Please pray that uh, she recovers to her normal health. That's, I remember here, Mary, uh, Mary A. Jackson, we need to, to remember. Um, let's see, here's one. Uh, yes, we need to remember Mike Dameron's wife. Mike's a, a, a very, very faithful person in this church, comes and is very, uh, he's a very quiet person, sits back over in this area oftentimes. Mike, I don't know that if you're here tonight, but his wife has cancer, and we need to be praying deep and praying fervently for her to do all that we can to, uh, to, uh, uh, that God will bless her and that we can become a blessing uh, in her life. She's not a member of the church, and so if you're looking for someone to send a card to, um, then uh, her name is Carmen. Uh, just use your church directory and uh, uh, find Mike's address and send her a card or something. I think that would really, really be outstanding. Uh, let's see, Viv uh, Vivian Blackmore says, would you remember my grandparents, Ken and Connie Tipton? Uh, they are traveling and visiting family in Arkansas and Tennessee for, uh, for, five, more, for at least five weeks. And so we need to remember uh, uh, Ken and Connie as they tra travel. Vivian also, would you remember my aunt? Her name is Kenna Hardy. She had surgery this morning and she is doing well. So we need to, to remember him in their prayer. Uh, Trish Clark says, would you remember Lynn Jorgerson? Uh, she's struggling with some health, health issues. We pray so often for Lynn. She's just uh, that, 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 a person who just has had a lot of adversity things happening in her life. We need to pray for them. Here's a name we'll all recognize, and, and that is the name Robert Martin. It's not Robert being sick. But Robert's mom passed away on Monday morning. And so we need to remember uh, uh, him in our prayers. Uh, and uh, we need to be praying for his whole family and everything. Uh, Robert is such a very special missionary to this church. And uh, this church loves him. We've been associated, well, this church for 20 plus years. I've known Robert for 40 years at least. And uh, so it's just, uh, he's just a very special person. And we need to remember him. John Patrick is a, a very frequent visitor. It's come from every Wednesday night. Got the biggest smile. Sits back here. You, you see him. He's going to have a smile. So, but he's coming also on some Sundays. And he says, uh, you pray for my time in court. Uh, thank you for your prayers. It worked out real good. And that's great. John, we, we, we're glad that, uh, that, you, that, that that happened that way. Now, I'm not sure if you were falsely accused or not, but I remember one time Paul was in court, and uh, they had, uh, uh, and, and so uh, it worked out good for him too. But John, we're glad that all of that has worked out and that things that we pray about are things that are important, and we need to thank God for everything that happens in our life. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer, and Ivan will lead the prayer for us. Let's pray. Most wonderful, loving, and caring Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for, for loving us and for always giving us the things that we need in this life. Father, we recognize when, when we do wrong and we pray that you forgive us when, when we mess up. Lord, at this time, we, we gather here together to, to pray for those that we love and care for, those that are in our hearts and our minds. Father, they're, they're dealing with many things in their lives, Father. There are things that they have no control over and father we know that you are the ultimate doctor the ultimate physician that can help them and lord we we also pray that you give us the the means and the tools to to be there for them and help them any way that we can lord at this time we pray for those that have been mentioned here tonight we pray for kate richardson amy west robert mariano sula garrett our Chaudens, Mary A. Jackson, Mike, Mike Demaron's wife, Ken and Connie Tipton, Kenna Hardy, Lynn Jorgensen, Roy Martin's family, and Joan Patrick. Lord, these loved ones are recovering from surgery doing rehab, dealing with health problems,
facing medical procedures. And Lord, there, some of them will be traveling. Lord, there, these things are the only things that you can be, that you are the answer to, that you can comfort us. Lord, we pray that you be with them, give them the comfort that they need, the strength that they need, and also be with the, those that are assisting them, the doctors, nurses. Pray that you give them the, the strength and the means to, to help them recover from all these health problems and physical things that they're, they're facing. And Father, we're mindful of our missionaries. They, they deal with many things in their lives. And as they continue to work for you, Lord, we pray that you continue to give them the strength, the peace, and the ability to overcome all the things that they may be facing. And Lord, we pray for our elders, our deacons, and our preachers, and their wives. We pray that you continue to bless them. We pray that you continue to give them the wisdom and the guidance to always make the right decisions, not just for them, but for us in our church. Lord, we pray for the future of our, of our congregation. We pray that you, that you be with us. Give us the strength, the wisdom, and the ability to always do right. Father, we love you, and we pray that you will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's a great joy to have everyone here tonight. We'd like to ask everyone, if you would, right now, reach and take one of these cards that you'll find in front of you and fill that out and pass that toward the center aisles. They'll be picked up momentarily. A lot of things are happening in this church, and so there are several announcements that are of importance, so please be aware of that. Uh, family groups one and two will meet at... Uh, Sky and David Brown's house at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. Those in that area, please be aware of that. This Sunday morning is Promotion Sunday, and we need to recognize that we'll all be in the auditorium. So if you come for Bible class hour, it's the time whenever, uh, even though the school promotes maybe at two or three weeks after this or some other, a little bit later, they got a head start here. And so uh, that we'll be having what we call Promotion Sunday, and they'll be going up to the older classes and uh, there is just a time to honor all of these young people that are there. And then following that, there is a luncheon for seniors to honor our seniors. We, we have some very, very special se seniors, and uh, we always have a, a graduation banquet. Now, it's potluck. Let me emphasize that. It is not just show up. It's potluck. And that doesn't, doesn't mean you bring pot, but it means you bring something in a pot, and, uh, and we'll share it together. How does that sound? If you've not been to one of these, what, one of these graduation banquets, you've missed something. So I said, well, I don't, I don't even, I, I don't, I'm not kin to any of those folks who are graduating. Uh, they're your brothers and sisters in Christ. I think that's pretty, pretty close kin and everything. And so I would encourage you. It's, it's a fun time. You'll laugh a lot, and you'll, you'll uh, see the depth of spirituality of, of these young people as uh, sometimes their lives are reviewed. Uh, 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 sometimes by loved ones, sometimes by photographs. And th that photograph is, uh, that is presented, I love that. To see these uh, young people, what they used to look like and what they look like. And all of you guys have improved a lot in, in my estimation. And so please be aware of that. Let's have an excellent turnout for that. Now in connection with that, after classes end tonight, we need several. I'm, I'm underlining several, which because our attendance is down a little bit tonight, I think that means every, everybody that possibly can to go into the family room to help arrange the tables and chairs. Uh, this is, we changed the whole setup of the room. I, I'm assuming we're gonna use round tables again uh, uh, this time, and so it means taking down all sorts of tables and moving chairs around, and that will happen after services tonight, and please uh, be aware of that. Junior high and senior high, you will meet uh, together, I'm assuming in the senior high room, and, uh, and so uh, junior and senior high will be meeting, meeting together. Um, I think that's all that I've got. Uh, what, you wanna talk about the classes we have? The Heroes classes is finished. We had four guys to, to present, each of them get doing a, uh, um, two of their heroes each, and so this, this quarter of the semester has nine weeks in it, and uh, there were only eight heroes they had. That's another, <laughs> they've got more than that, but the, each of them taught twice, and so that's what, that's the end of that session. So that class will not be, be will not be meeting tonight, 
And so uh, if you've been in that class, you'll need to select another class. The latest class will be uh, meeting in adult, adult two, and uh, uh, it's just for ladies. I'm sure you're, you would understand that. And uh, then in uh, adult one, David Sproul is teaching a class on one-on-one uh, classes with somebody that's not a Christian. How do you teach the gospel to somebody that's not a Christian? And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a how to do it class, and it is something that will really, really be um, a blessing for you. Uh, in the auditorium, we will finish the study of the book of Esther, and uh, please be aware of that. Remember, the, the, for two or three of the last years, we've had Kickstart Your Summer. Uh, that's coming up. It'll, it will not be next week. It, was the, it starts next week. Starts next week. Uh, Kickstart Your Summer. We'll be inviting in preachers from all over this area on Wednesday night to come and to present the, pre- present the lessons here in this auditorium. And uh, I've enjoyed that. We did not do it last year because of the kinds of things, the schedule that we had. Decided to do it again this year. And so uh, uh, it gives you a chance to hear some, uh, uh, some other preachers from this area. And it's always uplifting. So keep that in mind for next Wednesday night. Sunday morning, everybody here in the auditorium. Senior high luncheon after services on Sunday morning. It's potluck. Let's go to our classes and let's... Uh, All right, it's time for us to get started in here, and we're going to hopefully finish the book of Esther tonight. Now, do you have a Bible program on your, uh, on your phone? Bobo, you got, you got a Bible program on your phone? If, if you got a Bible program, I want you to find the first time the word God is found in the book of Esther. Uh, any, any of you can do that? It's just a uh, search and find the first time the word God is found in the book of Esther. You, if you don't have a smartphone, you might just want to sort, can you skim real fast and see the word God? Um, in, uh, in the book of Esther, just, just uh, find the first time. And uh, we, we, we'll try to look at it the first time. And if we have time, we'll look at it the second and third time. If, uh, if, if, you'll, if you'll help me find where the word God is in the book of Esther. Uh, uh, Holter, you got, a, you got a smartphone and everything? Or do you? I thought, I thought for sure you'd be the one who, who would find that for me. Don't have it tonight, okay. All right, let's get to the book of Esther. I, I want to start in chapter 7, and I know that we're beyond chapter 7 uh, in our study, but that's the background. Haman, evil Haman, has gone out to destroy the Jews, paid the king 10,000 pieces of silver, and now has issued a decree that every Jew is to be killed. Uh, it, it's, it's the sunset of Judaism. Well, not that every Jew which should be killed was subject to being killed. And if you kill a Jew, you get their possessions. That's not a bad... Uh, Chad, I know you love hunting. And so if you lived at that time, just go find you some little short Jew and that's got a lot of money and, and fire away and you can take all of his money. That's not a bad arrangement and everything. Uh, and, and so uh, that, that was the decree. Now, remember about Persian law? Once it, it's issued, it cannot be rescinded. And that's so vital to understand. Now that worked, by the way, for, for the Jews when they were ready to rebuild the city, rebuild the temple. Because there was that decree from the Persian king, Cyrus the Persian king, that says this temple is going to be rebuilt. And when all of the enemies that were there were trying to uh, keep them from rebuilding the temple... Uh, that's not a bad law when, when uh, it favors you. 
But when it gets to that other side, like it is in the book of Esther, it, 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 is, you know, it, it is really something. So uh, Mordecai tells Esther, Esther, uh, you're, you need to, to see what you can do to help this. And uh, we spent time, we spent almost a half of a class talking about perhaps you've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. You need to understand that in your life, circumstances develop and perhaps you're there for that purpose. Uh, Chad, you're headed for Mississippi. Is that what I've heard? Got a little place to live yet? Haven't got a place to live yet. Chad, in that apartment, in that complex where you're going to be living, perhaps in that very building is somebody that needs the gospel. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? To live your life that way. You live the rest of your life, every person you meet. It changes, it changes your worldview uh, uh, tremendously. And, 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 and we need to recognize that. Perhaps this person you meet, you know, on the way home you have a wreck. You've got that person's name and address right there. What more could you want? And I'm not encouraging you to go out and have a wreck or anything. But how do you know? How do you know that that person that you meet, even somebody that's, that's not kind to you, perhaps, you know, if they're not kind, they really need the gospel. You know, and, and uh, now if they've got an AK-47, you don't, you need to be, walk a little bit more carefully, but you've got a sword, and so you need to understand that. I love that concept from the book of Esther. I've lived oftentimes my life by that very concept. It helps you, the expression we used in New Zealand, the mission field, are you seeing souls? Are you seeing souls? Everybody you run into tomorrow at work, they, they, they have a soul. They are a soul. And we've got to see their souls and not, and not, and not see them as just a, somebody that's coming in to cause trouble or something like that. We've got, we've got to view that that way. So Esther, knowing that she doesn't have a right to go before the king, that tells you how great that king was and, and what a great uh, uh, person he was in, in authority. You cannot walk into the presence of the king and live unless he extends the scepter out to you. So Mordecai and Esther arranged for Esther to go, bef uh, uh, the plan for Esther to go before Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus extends the rod to her and says, uh, what do you want, Esther? I'll give you up to half of my kingdom. You know how big that gift is? 127 provinces, and this is on one of the slides of tonight, but if you got a world map inside your head, from India to Ethiopia, he ruled the world. And then uh, uh, in, the, in the last chapter, I believe it says, and the islands, I think it's the first time the islands are mentioned. I'm not even sure what those islands are, but it's not just the land mass, but he but he'd conquered all of the islands that were there. And she said, I'll give you half of those. 127 provinces, you can have 62 or 63 and a half of the provinces. I'll give you, up to, give you up to half of that. And she says, I want you and Haman to come for, for a banquet tomorrow. And so uh, uh, Haman is so uh, wrapped up in himself and everything, we'll not spend much time at all talking about him, it just, it just, except to talk about how tragic it is uh, that one little thing can ruin your life. He was almost second in command. Uh, so I read the expression today that, uh, uh, and, and this is mar modern terminology, but think about the British system. Uh, Ahasuerus was the, uh, uh, was the king, but Mordecai became the prime minister. I love that concept, you know, if you understand the British, the, the whole British system, and that's where Mordecai is. And Haman is almost there, he's not quite there, but Haman is the one who, who says, let's, let's kill all of the Jews and sends out that decree. Well, whenever, Morde whenever they arrive at the palace, this is in chapter 7, uh, Mordecai, or the king says to, Ahaz, to, uh, to Esther, what's your request? And this is the second time, by the way. And, and the request was the second time, I want you to save our lives. Somebody has planned to kill me and all of my people. And uh, he said, who is it? And he says, it's Haman. It's this evil man who hates the Jews and specifically hates one Jew, and that's Mordecai. In fact, 
when Haman is there at this very time, the night before he's built a gallus 50 cubits high. Do you think about that in reference to, 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 to real money? 75 feet up in the air to hang one man on. That is an astounding, uh, uh, that's an astounding manifestation of hate. I, I think that, that, that's it, you know. Um, I don't know when you were a kid, if you threw a temper tantrum, you know, if you broke one of your mama's glass, uh, glass you know, or tore up one of your brother's toys or something like that, uh, that's bad enough to get you in trouble, but you go in there and you tear up everything in, in, in his room and, and tear up all of his books and all the rest, that's overkill. And what a play on words, a 75-foot 75 75-foot 75 gallus is overkill. And, uh, well, whenever uh, the king hears this, that's, that's his number, number two man in the kingdom. And he gets so upset, he walks away, and while he's out of the place, uh, uh, Haman comes and, and starts begging uh, Esther to, to do something. Evidently, that's the implication. And when the king walks back in, there's Haman, uh, well, I, I, I want to say laying on the couch, but, but some way on the couch on which Esther is reclined, and Haman thinks he, he's trying to assault my wife. We used the word rape last week, and, and uh, that may be an overstatement. I doubt that it is, or if you start thinking about assault in relationship to this, because he was one going to kill the Jews. It may, be, it, it, uh, may, it may not be rape, it may be something else. And so he says, kill Haman. And so one of the eunuchs that's there says in the last verses of chapter 7, he's got a gallows built. And so the king says, take him and hang him high. Take him out to the gallows. And on the very gallows on which he had planned to kill Mordecai, and uh, it was going to happen that very morning. The very morning when he was in there at the banquet, he had walked down to the king's palace to get the permission from the king to, uh, to, to kill Haman, no, uh, pardon me, to kill Mordecai, and uh, uh, it's not going to happen. And that very day, he's put to death. And so, we talked about this last week, Esther was given Haman's house. Now, Haman has 10,000 pieces of silver. Wonder what his house looked like. Can I say Palm Beach? You know, I mean, you, you get a picture if I say Palm Beach, uh, that's what the house looked like. I mean, it had to look like this. And, uh, uh, and so she's given that. Guess who she gives it to? She gives it to her cousin Mordecai. And so here's Mordecai who has, uh, you know, been living almost out at the gate of the palace and uh, weeping at some times because of the decree that Haman had sent out worldwide. And it is interesting that at that time, the Bible says that, uh, that uh, Ahasuerus gave to Mordecai the signet ring that Haman had had. And so evidently before he was sent to the gallows, he took the ring away. It, it's not absolutely necessary, but it seems to fit the flow of the story a whole lot better. Uh, and, they, and, and so he gives it to Mordecai because he loves Mordecai. Mordecai, as we talked about way back in chapter 2 or 3, had saved the life of the king from assassination. And, uh, and, and so now Esther gives her request. And Esther says, rescind that decree, but Persian law cannot be changed. How are you going to save the Jews? Well, Mordecai's plan is, with the king's approval, is to write a second royal decree. By the way, you found where God is yet? We could go to that verse yet. You found it yet? You hadn't found it? Are you serious? Anybody else look? Johnny, if you find it, Johnny, find the word God. Find the first time it's used in the, in the book of... Gail shaking her head, it's not in there. Are you serious? I was going to do this right at the end of class, but I think this is the time to do it. The word God is not in the book of Esther. He's in every verse. Isn't that amazing? 
Every book in the Bible has some reference to God or to the Lord or to Jehovah or, or to Jesus. Reference deity. But this is, there, the, the name God is not found in this book. Now, if we have time at the end, we're going to come back and talk about how lucky she was, how everything worked out for her in relationship to this. Well, well then, then how, how, do you, how do you save these individuals? Well, uh, here's the plan that goes out. The royal decree to save the, save the Jews is on the day of the first decree, whenever that was, that was to be, uh, all the Jews could be hunted and killed, on that very day, every Jew has a right to save himself and other Jews. In fact, let them gather together. And so, Ted, uh, <laughs> you're going out hunting. I want you to know, uh, you, you're not, it's, it's not just that little Jew that, that you're going to shoot down. Uh, there, there, there's a, there, there are 700 other Jews with AK-47s when you, when you get there. And the decree is that if they kill you, they get your possessions. How's that for rolling the dice? I'm going hunting and, and, and the bear eats you. You understand? I mean, I mean that, that's, that's the kind of thing that's going to happen. That's not what you call a good hunting day. And so they said, on that day, the Jews can defend themselves. And this royal decree was delivered to all 127 of the provinces. In fact, uh, the, the, uh, the Bible talks about the, the horses and, and, and about how they spread this message and everything. Let's get to chapter 9 then. This is some... some uh, uh, ground we have not plowed as we try to finish this book tonight in chapter 9 on the day that the Jews were to be killed now what day of the year is that you know Jewish calendar or, or, or part of the Persian calendar likely on the, on, the, on the 13th day of the 12th month now how did they pick that date well, they cast lots. I have no idea what that is. But if you read back in chapter 4, whenever Haman is trying to, trying to figure out, evidently, because of the word, I think the word is until in that verse, indicated they said, is it going to be the first month? And when they cast lots, the first month didn't come up. And so they kept casting lots until they got to the 12th month. And it's on the, on the 13th day of the 12th of the month because Haman's decree was written on the 13th day of, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the first month. And it was to be enacted on the, 12, on the 13th day of the 12th month. Nearly a year from day one. Uh, uh, 13th day of January to the 13th day of December. And I'm, I'm using modern names for, for their calendar started at a different time of the year when I always did and all. Just give us a mental picture of it. Now then, Mordecai's decree was written in the third month. For us to understand, that's March, isn't it? So January, the decree goes out. You can hunt the Jews in December. In March... Mordecai's decree is written and it is sent out and it is distributed. And this is where the verse says, from India to Ethiopia. Uh, that's a, such a massive, massive distance. Now, go back to the fact that whenever Vashti was deposed, when the first queen would not show her beauty in that drunken feast, then the decree went out to, to all the 127 provinces. How many beautiful damsels were there from India to Ethiopia? That's remarkable, isn't it? It is remarkable that Esther was ever even selected. And uh, obviously, uh, the king was not aware of, of her, uh, um, that, that, that she was Jewish. And so... Chapter 8, chapter 9, verse 2 says, The Jews 
successfully defended themselves. Well, they've got nine months to get ready. Uh, I don't think they waited till the 11th month or, you know, or uh, to, to the first day of the 12th month to get ready. Can you imagine the planning that would have been done? If you knew somebody was going to come and rob your house, and you had nine months to, to get ready for it, yeah, I'd be ready for it. You would too. And so whenever that day came, there was not a single Jew that, uh, that uh, was killed. And then the decree said that the Jews can, on that same day, can go out and kill their enemies. And so they defend themselves, and there's some numbers down here that I think will absolutely surprise you about how many were killed. Because the decree says to the Jews, you kill, if you kill your enemies, you can kill any of your enemies you want to, and you can take their possessions. And so they went out and defended themselves, and the Bible indicates in verse 3 and 4, that even the Persian officials assisted the Jews. How's this for a turn of events? God's not in this book. How's this for a turn of events? Here are the Persian officials. You think uh, those officials may have been, and there's a list of the names of, 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 of them in, in, uh, in the text. And so there's a list of some of these names, these officials that were there. And so you've got to not only deal with the fact that, uh, that you've got this first decree and the second decree, and there's no penalty at all. And the Jews defended themselves. But I want to point out something. They took not one penny of the spoils. Isn't that remarkable? Isn't that remarkable? Sometimes we make good decisions because of who we are without somebody having to tell us that. You need to train yourself in, I uh, don't know exactly how to say this, in the moral, spiritual side of your life. Instead of waiting to some crisis comes into your life and then you spontaneously respond to that. If you wait at that time to develop kindness, if you wait at that time to develop a long-suffering spirit, if you wait at that time and you take any of those biblical words that you might respond to in relationship to that, if you wait at that time to think, well, maybe I ought to be long-suffering. No. If you wait till the crisis comes, you're probably not going to do, do, do what's right. Um, let me tell you something. We need to know right so much that we don't have to all even decide at a time like that because we've learned the importance. It's always right to do right. If you write that on your soul, That'll help you. When Troy and Josh were here, before they went to Paraguay, they went out uh, hunting for wild hogs. And uh, Josh heard Troy shoot his gun. They were some distance apart. Two shots. And so Josh came out of his stand wherever he was to go find Troy and he got over there 
and uh, this hog had come through the through the shrub through, through the bush, bushes that were there, and Josh, being the good shot that he was, shot that thing. And uh, lo and behold, it wasn't a wild hog at all. It was a bear. It's not bear season. But the bear was not dead, so he had to shoot it again, put it out of its misery. And Josh said, he walked over there, and Troy was saying, it's always right to do right. <laughs> the rest of that story was he went and reported it to the game warden, thought that's the right thing to do. And after he reported it to the game warden, the game warden Mirandized him. Is that the, is that the word I want? <laughs> Read him his rights and everything. I mean, <laughs> He, did, he, didn't like that. he didn't like that turn in that. In, 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 in that. By the way, whenever the game warden went out and said, that law wasn't written for you. It was written for poachers. And, uh, and so nothing ever came of it. But I just thought, uh, Josh said, I walked over there and Troy was saying, it's always right to do right. Would you write that on your soul? Do right. And so they didn't take that. They absolutely did not take any of the spoils. And, uh, and uh, that day in the capital city, in the royal city, they killed 500 of their enemies. And then they said, give us another day. And so the king gave them the right on the day after to go out and kill the, uh, some more of their enemies. And they killed 300 more of their enemies in that one city. But those 127 provinces, and this is the number that amazed me, I told David, how can I read the Bible and not, not see things like this? They killed 75,000 of their enemies. Does that sort of change the, the course of your life? I mean, you stop and think of it. They killed 75,000 of their enemies. They're in this time of the restoration, going back from Babylonian captivity. Not all of them's gone back. But even those that did not go back, God took care of them. You're talking about a time of peace and possible prosperity. Here it is. And so now the Jews are so, so blessed that they decide, and they are starting in, in chapter 9, the the last 14 or 15 verses of, of chapter 9 tells about this feast that they set up. And so it was, it was, a, it was a feast, and I'll, I'll read to you in a moment about uh, how the feast is observed nowadays, and it's all based on this right here. It's called the Feast of Purim, P-U-R-I-M. It was a Jewish feast day, not one of the, the three big feast days, Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Not one of, not one of those feasts. But they, they set up and they continued that practice as a celebration of a day of national deliverance. If I say July the 4th, there are some places on this earth, Americans don't need to talk about July the 4th and what it stands for, uh, namely New Zealand, where we received, July the 4th is where we got our independence from, from Britain. And so we would jokingly say to, to New Zealanders, well, there's a holiday in America, Martin, I'm not going to tell you what it's all about, though. The uh, celebration of deliverance. Are there not times when you enjoy singing God Bless America? 
Ja. You, 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 you see bodies that brought back from Vietnam, from Afghanistan, and those bodies left off the, as they offloaded off of the plane for the passengers on that plane to start uniformly singing together, God bless America. How do you reckon the Jews felt about this feast? I hope I've got this other page and uh, uh, whoever's on the, on the screen back there, if you go to the very last slide on this, I don't know, I think it's one, 196 or something like that. I, I think that, that's the one. Here is the modern celebration of Purim. This is from International Standard Bible Encyclopedia that says, in succeeding generations, as the Jews have passed from one civilization or empire to another. Uh, it's the very last slide. Just, just keep going all the way to the end. I, I may not have even put it on that, on, that, on, that, uh, on that flash drive. So just listen. In succeeding centuri centuries, as the Jews have passed from one civilization or empire to another, so many causes have arisen to remind them of the persecutions of Haman, as to make the festival of, of a triumph over such persecution attractive and significant to them. The 13th day of that month is observed by fasting in commemoration of Esther's prayer and the fasting the Jews were doing as she approached the king. In the evening, at the beginning of the fourth day, the Jews repair to their synagogues, means they assemble, where the book of Esther, and then here's a Hebrew word, and uh, anybody want to pronounce uh, uh, Megillah, something like that, and that's the Hebrew word for rolls. I had no idea what it was. The five, there are five shorter books that the Jews called the rolls, like the book of Ruth, and obviously this book, and so as they divided the, the, the Bible up into, you know, uh, into, into categories, there were those shorter books. We talk about, the, sometimes we'll have a class on the five one chapters books in the Bible or something like that. And so they did that sort of thing. And on this day, the book of Esther is read with interpretations and uh, execrations bursting out at the reading of Haman's name. We've talked about this. In the synagogue, if, even with the children assembled, they'll read this, and every time the, word, the name Haman is, uh, uh, is, is mentioned, they start booing. They start, uh, you know, uh, figuratively, or maybe even literally, shaking their fist at him, accompanied by the noise of, of rattles and the stamping of feet. Uh, other persecutors and foes also come into, into the share of execration. The name of Mordecai and Esther's receives blessings. On the following morning of the 14th, synagogue services are held again, at which in addition to the repetition of Esther's reading, which records the destruction of the Amalekites, talked about it's found in Exodus 17, and you've got the Amalekites and King Agag, we talked about him last week, because uh, Haman was an Agite, is also read as the lesson from the law. Presents are given to the poor and to friends and the rest of the day, and also on the 15th, observed with feasting and rejoicing, even excesses being condoned in the exuberance of a national spirit. Again, that sounds like July the 4th and trying to drive home after the celebration by the looks of the fireworks. When I read that last uh, statement and everything. I want us to uh, look at chapter 10, only three verses in it. I think it's remarkable in chapter 10 that, uh, uh, well, we get, get to chapter 10, the only three verses. I find it remarkable that uh, Ahasuerus imposes taxes. Sometimes there are things in the Bible, Tim, you and I were talking about this before services. I don't even know why they're there. I mean, you know, they're just things that are there. I just, 
in my mind, I called attention to them, but uh, he imposed taxes on 127 provinces. That'd be a pretty healthy income, wouldn't it? From, from Ethiopia to uh, uh, India, and the Bible says he imposed taxes. But then you look at in, in, in verse 2, there Mordecai is mentioned in the written accounts of the Chronicles of Persia. Wouldn't it be wonderfully ironic if someday archaeologists might be able to find this history? It's not been found. But the fact it's not found doesn't mean he did not live. But I think it is interesting that the Bible wants us to see Mordecai for what he was, from a man who had a heart of compassion. And so his uncle's, uh, his uncle dies. And there's a little young lady called Esther, and he raises her. And then the Bible talks about the greatness, and that's in verse 3, that he was the second most powerful man in Persia. He was loved and honored by the Jews, and he sought the good of his people, speaking peace. Book of Esther. Wasn't she lucky? Wasn't she lucky? Lucky to be beautiful. If you happen to fall into that category, don't get too excited. Look at your mother. Someday you're going to look like what she looks like. But she's beautiful. And wasn't she lucky that of all of the young women, if there was one, the most beautiful one from each of the 127 provinces, could there have been as many as two? Could have been five? It takes a year to, to, for all of them to, uh, uh, to be brought to the king. And she sure was lucky that whenever, whenever uh, she was brought to the palace, that there was this eunuch there in whose eyes she finds favor and he treats her better than any of the other, any of the other uh, virgins that are there in the palace. And wasn't it, was she just lucky that she had enough sense to ask him, now when I go before the king, wasn't it just lucky that he happened to be there? Uh, what, should I, ha, ha, what should I do to please the king? And wow, man, wasn't she lucky to be the one chosen? You know, that's not just Miss America. That's Miss Persia of 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. And wasn't she lucky to have a, someone like Mordecai to raise her? Just lucky. And wasn't she lucky uh, when she went before the king for him to hold out that scepter? And wasn't she lucky that the king says, I find such favor in you, I'll give you half of my kingdom if you'll just ask. And wasn't she really, really lucky that that Haman happened to be there whenever she's going to the second day and she's going to tell the king uh, of her request. She sure was lucky that Haman was there. He could have been busy some other place and could not have been able. He could have been not have finished the gallows and he's over there working. I, you know, just lucky. And wasn't she lucky that when the king walked back in, Haman was where he was. Down to the very place in that room. Wasn't she lucky? And wasn't she lucky that she got Haman's house? And wasn't she lucky that Mordecai had 
found that assassination plot. And wasn't, she, wasn't it she lucky that, that, the, that the king had failed to reward Mordecai? And one night, the night before the banquet, one night before the banquet, the king cannot sleep and he, start, he starts reading Persian history and he finds out what, about Mordecai and he said, what have I done to honor this man? That's his first real introduction to this man, Mordecai. And wasn't she lucky that, when it went, that, uh, that Mordecai was her cousin? And wasn't she lucky? You want to finish the book? You want to go through the rest of the book and talk about how lucky she was? And sometimes we say, I wish you good luck. I wish you good luck on the, on the new job you've got. And I do. But I'm telling you, child of God, it's not good luck. It's good God. Go through this book and become a Jew and have all of the emotions that they had whenever that decree comes out that all of the Jews are to be killed. Isn't that remarkable? That decree's been out there for two months. You think they're in some sleepless mamas and daddies seeing their children and knowing that, you know, that in the twelfth month they're all going to be dead. And all of the emotions, and you know Persian law cannot be changed, and you would throw up your hands in despair and say, we're dead. Well, guys, we wish you good luck. No, we have a good God. And whatever's happening in your life, I stand here and I look at you and know the backgrounds of so many of you. And I think what you've been through. Were you lucky, Freddie? <laughs> when that man was at the wrong house and had a gun and came to shoot somebody and shot through Freddie's door and shot him five times, Freddie? You sure were lucky. Shot, taught, shot him twice. Several shots fired. I'm not saying that if bad things happen to us because Job says, shall we receive good at the hand of God and not evil? I'm not saying bad luck is, is evidence that God is angry at you. But if there's anything we ought to get out of this last five weeks as we study this book of Esther, it is. I don't need luck. I have God. And so whatever happens, whatever the doctor says next time you go to him, whatever happens in the workplace, what, whatever happens with your children or your grandchildren, whatever happens, it's not good luck. It's a good God. Thank you so much for being a part of this study tonight and, this, and for this whole week.